The following program will make you want to grow things and experience new and wonderful dreams about your plants, garden, and garden design. Listener participation is always strongly advised. And welcome to Down the Garden Path with your host, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101. To contact us live, send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, right to your hosts of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Thank you and welcome everyone to Down the Garden Path on this lovely, chilly, bright, sunny day in March. <laughs> um, so I wanted to welcome everybody to Down the Garden Path where we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice for your plants, gardens, and landscapes. As a landscape designer and gardener, both of us gardeners, uh, we think it's important and possible to have great gardens that are low maintenance, and we want to help you make, make it happen as well. I am Joanne Shaw, landscape designer and owner of Down the Garden, or sorry, I, I guess Down the Garden Path <laughs> yeah. is where I'm here too, and Down to Earth Landscape Design for the past 11 years. It is currently a design only business here east of the GTA. And with me tonight, once again, hello, Matthew, is Matthew Dressing. Hello, Joanne, and welcome back, everyone, to Down the Garden Path. I am Matthew Dressing, horticulturist and landscape designer and owner of Natural Affinity Designs. Natural Affinity is a landscape design and garden maintenance firm servicing Toronto and the Eastern GTA. And unlike Joanne, I'm just kind of on the beginning of my journey. Uh, so each week we do enjoy doing Down the Garden Path, bringing you interesting, relevant, and helpful topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from each other, from our research, and from the guests that join us here on the show. So we welcome all of your questions via social media or email. And uh, we have a great guest this evening on the show. So make sure in studio 101 at gmail.com, mm -hmm. you are going to want to ask your questions. That's right. And with the sun and a little bit of uh, spring, first day of spring tomorrow. Tomorrow. That's finally. right. I think everybody, uh, hopefully all our listeners are tuning in anxiously because uh, there's lots to talk about. There is. That's a lot right. To talk about. And I'm really excited about our topic tonight and our guest this evening. Yeah. So we have uh, John Robertson from Natural Insect uh, Control. And of course, I don't have my papers with me, so I'm being bad. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, so beneficial insects are really a popular topic right now. And because uh, this includes everything from ladybugs to mason bees. So uh, so yeah, so get your pollinator questions and your beneficial insect questions ready for John, yes. well, uh, Matthew gets his bio ready. <laughs> my, apology, my printer stopped working, so I've got everything on my phone. So a little bit about natural insect control. Uh, so NIC, as they're also known, has been supplying top quality solutions for pest control for 28 years. They specialize in beneficial insects, biological pest controls, and beneficial nematodes for natural control in greenhouses and growing systems. And I see is the source for natural insect controls and eco-friendly green products for any growing system. They specialize in designing preventative programs as well. The core values of NIC are based on providing the freshest beneficial insects or biocontrols possible for their clients in order to gain the results they want. 
client care, incorporating fast, informative service, and educating the worldly community of their options and choices of alternatives to chemicals for our, their own backyards, their homes, gardens, lawns, whatever they want to create a sanctuary, wherever they want to create a sanctuary. Um, so John is joining us from NIC. Uh, a little bit about John before we bring him on the show. Uh, John was raised in a very earth conscious household and taught to be aware that our actions have repercussions in the environment. Some would say in a hippie manner. <laughs> so he grew up around beneficial insects and trying out new natural pest control methods on their farm. But like most kids, he left where he came from to start his own life. He went to the West Coast, where he had a variety of jobs as a commercial fisherman, marine salvage. Then he moved to Whistler, where he got into emergency services and was a fireman and worked with the local health clinic. There he got a passion for helping sick, sick people and decided to study paramedicine and become a paramedic. He was stationed on Bowen Island and regularly worked in Vancouver. When their mother passed away in 2013, Susan, his sister, uh, and he decided that we didn't want to see her dream die. So we made a deal to keep the company going, Natural Insect Control, and purchased the company from their stepfather as he had moved to Australia with her family. And he moved home from Vancouver to Niagara Falls, Ontario, to keep NIC alive. So thank you very much, John, for joining us uh, down the garden path. Yeah, no problem. It's a pleasure talking to you both. So thank you for having me on the show. And that sounds like quite a journey. Yeah, indeed it was. <laughs> indeed it was. Uh, Susan and I, like I was uh, mentioning, most kids sort of leave where they come from and start their own lives. But we always uh, we always believed in Mum's dream and what she was doing, and it uh, drew us back to where we came from. So we're both, uh, as of 2014, we both are stationed in Niagara Falls and have been running the company since then. Very nice. Excellent. And Excellent. how did your mother start uh, natural insect control? Yeah, it's a funny story. Like I said, it uh, was mentioned in my bio, in the bio, my mom was a bit of a hippie. They uh, started a farm here, and they called it the natural farm, and they wanted to, uh, uh, to not use any pesticides on their property. They wanted to be an organic farm. So she went out into the market. They were having some pest problems, particularly with uh, manure flies because they had some cattle and they had some pigs. So they were running into trouble with manure flies, so they went on the market to find out some natural controls for these. She found out there was nothing available in Canada. She could get some products out of the States, but that was all. So uh, I guess a light bulb went off, bing, and she decided to uh, start a beneficial insect business. Wow, that's so, great. Uh, yeah, it's kind of neat. So the first thing that they sold was <coughs> a fly parasite, basically. It was a little wasp that, uh, that uh, enters the egg of a, uh, of a uh, fly. Uh, deposits its own egg in there, it parasitizes the egg, kills the fly, fly larva, and produces its more wasps. So that was the very first product that we started out with, and uh, she started selling it on her kitchen table, basically. Very cool. Very good. Would they say um, invention is the mother, or what's that term? Necessity um, is the mother of invention. There you go. <laughs> it sounds like that's a perfect uh, perfect thing. So Yeah, uh, absolutely. And like I say, they started with uh, fly parasites, selling to local, basically. It worked so well, they told two friends, and they told two friends, so they started selling them. And then, uh, as you mentioned earlier in the uh, opening, uh, ladybugs became uh, mm -hmm. one of the next uh, next products that they sold. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic, uh, beneficial. I call them sort of the poster child of beneficial insects. <laughs> they so are, true. yeah, because they're so photogenic too. <laughs> mm -hmm. For for a bug, they're a good looking bug. That's, that's right. That's <laughs> right. As far as insects go, they are a pretty cute bug. Come, yeah. you can dress up for anything that you can dress up for Halloween, right? Yeah. <laughs> I saw a great little cartoon the other day. It's this little boy. And He's looking at ladybugs, and he's like, oh, they're all so cute. And then it's got this really microscopic blow-up, and it's this ferocious-looking ladybug eating an aphid. <laughs> 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 the reality of it. It's yes, yes, for sure. Because a especially in the Niagara region, I'm originally from Welland, but r which is the Rose City. So, right. you mean, the roses, I w you know, aphids, controlling aphids on roses is probably a, a huge deal. Absolutely, absolutely. And ladybugs, ladybugs are a great predator. They'll eat any soft-bodied insect, hmm. but they put their favorite food by far and away is an aphid. Okay. So they'll go, they'll, they'll climb like three quarters up a plant to get to an aphid before they'll eat anything else. But, so in that regard, they're like sort of a, 
a heat-seeking missile when it comes to aphids. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So beyond ladybugs, what else does uh, NIC supply? Um, so we are the um, only Canadian producer of nematodes. What that is is uh, we we actually uh, make nematodes. Wow! And a nematode is a microscopic worm that infects larvae. So it's a really good predator for any um, any insect that you have that does a larvae stage in the soil. Basically, most people know them and use them for um, lawn grubs. The little C-shaped white grubs that get into your lawn. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's, the, that's probably the most popular item that we have uh, as far as beneficials. Uh, the next one I would say was prey mantis. We do a lot with prey mantis. Um, and then you get into what you mentioned earlier, sort of the mason bees, the leaf cutter bees, the, the solitary bees for pollination. Okay. But nematodes by far and away are the sort of the bread and butter of our business at this juncture. Right. And you mentioned the only Canadian source. Yeah, so we're the only people actually producing them, and we do a very unique methodology. Pretty much every other company that's dealing with nematodes does them in bioreactors and laboratories. So they're doing it in uh, vitro style, whereas we're doing it in vivo. And what that means, sorry about that one sec. Um, What that means is that we actually infect a grub, and then we harvest from said grub. So it's actually cycled in nature. And it actually makes for a stronger, better nematode. As you can imagine, only the uh, strong can get out of the uh, grub. So they've actually been cycling through nature in the wild. So they're actually attuned to Canadian pests particularly. And they're attuned to the environment outside of a bioreactor. So it makes for a much better product. It's a little labor uh, intensive, but we feel it's worth it because it does make a better product for the end results for the end user. So is it... Your in vivo process, is it in a controlled environment or is it like literally out back in the ground? Um, it's more of a, we've got a Quonset sort of area. So it's, it's a big garage and sort of contained and all that sort of thing. But yeah, we're, uh, we, we've uh, got a little area. We're based out of Stevensville. And uh, yeah, so basically we get a lot of bugs. We infect them with nematodes. And nematodes are interesting in the sense that when they enter a, um, a grub, they actually use that, They first they kill it by releasing a bacteria, which causes septicemia. Mm. So they kill the grub, and then it gets a little gory, but that liquefies the grub's organs, and then they use the, that nutrient-rich broth to breed it. So they use the cadaver as a breeding chamber. So they breed and breed and breed and breed, and then when they run out of room, they break out of that. I say kind of like the movie Aliens, you know, when they break out of the stomach. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Sort of like that. It's a bit gory in the bug world, but it works well. <laughs> um, and then they go off hunting for more grubs. So in essence, if, uh, let's say, 100 nematodes enter a grub's body, you get out 10,000 on the other side. Wow. Yeah, so it's pretty, I say it's like an inverted pyramid. So when you're actually spraying your lawn to get grubs, you always start at the most affected area because every grub you infect with nematodes, you're going to get that many more of the good guys in a two-week cycle. They'll be out hunting for more grubs. Hmm. So the beauty of the way we do our product is you're guaranteed that you're going to get the second and the third and the fourth generation. When they're made in bioreactors and test tubes, you're not guaranteed that because you're not guaranteed that each nematode carries the bacteria. That is huge, I think. Yeah. It makes a big, big difference. Like like I say, you might get the initial knockdown, but you're not getting that continual growth of nematodes in your soil, which is, as you know, making a better soil and a better environment. Right. So after someone who applies your nematodes, it's, you know, say the third generation, how many more generations, like how long do these nematodes stay in the soil? Yeah, so basically I say most people, because it's a two-week cycle for a nematode's life cycle, I say you're getting... You're, you're sort of getting really good results at 30 days. So the beauty mm-hmm. of uh, Mother Nature is she works, but she works on her own time. So mm-hmm. it's not like the old days where we'd spray a chemical and everything would die instantly. Right. Right. So I say 30 days for people. They should be seeing noticeable results on their properties in 30 days. That being said, they've actually had nematode cycle in a place in France for 60 years. As long as there's a food source and, they, and they don't, uh, it doesn't freeze, or they don't get caught in a freeze, they will continue to cycle. Ideally, you've killed all the pests and you don't have a food source anymore and they die off. Right, right, right. But yeah, as long as there's food for them, they will continue to cycle. And when I say when they get caught freezing, 
like, I don't know where you guys, where we were two years ago, the ground froze four feet deep. It was like a horrendous winter. Right. So everything in the soil died. The good guys, the bad guys, all. So for the winter, what they do is, like the grubs, they burrow down below the frost level. If they have enough time to get down there, they'll survive the winter. If they don't, if they get caught like in a deep freeze, like everything, they they will die. So I didn't think that. I thought they were done. Because even the the window to apply nematodes is, whether you do it in the spring or the fall, there's certainly a short window. Yeah, and that has more to do with the grub life cycle than the nematode. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Everybody thinks it's a nematode. It's actually the other way around. Because they infect the larva. What happens with, um, let's say, Japanese beetle, because that's the most common pest in Ontario. Yeah. Right? So they turn into, they pupate in the spring. So you want to do it early in the spring because once they pupate and they come, a pupa is kind of like a, almost like a tank to get into. They get a really hard cuticle because they're metamorphosizing within that. So the nematodes can't penetrate them. So basically in the spring you do an early application. So any of the ones that survive the winter and, uh, winter and are now coming up to eat the uh, grass roots because they eat the new hairs on the roots first. And of course, like a bear in hibernation, they come up, they're very ferociously mm. hungry. So they can do a lot of damage in the spring. That's why people notice the damage in the spring in their lawns as well. So if you get a spray then, everyone you kill doesn't have a chance to pupate, doesn't turn into a bug, no babies. So it is worthwhile doing a spring application. Okay. But I always say if you're going to do one a year, do fall. Okay. Okay. And the reason is because, so the Japanese beetles turn into a beetle, they swarm, they tend to eat, um, they like a waxy leaf, so they, they're notoriously bad on rose bushes, linden trees, things of that nature. They breed, they mate, they ovi deposit, lay eggs in your lawn. Those eggs hatch, and then their first instars, they do three instars in the fall. So what that means is just the size of the grub. They'll, they'll eat, eat, eat. They'll break out of their skin, do the next size. So they do three instars. Like anything, they're easier to take care of when they're young. Mm, okay. So if you do a fall application, you've got a bigger window to apply nematodes. And the grubs themselves are more susceptible to a nematode uh, um, application. Okay. And then you don't get the damage in the spring. So right. So it's, it's a proactive way of approaching it. All right. Well, I did and mine they, in the fall, so I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. um, so what is our window like? So it, it, I'm sure that's a, a tar- moving target, right, to say what are the weeks that would be good for a spring application. It, yeah, it all depends on temperature base. So okay. in the spring, as soon as your soil temperature hits 10 degrees, you should be applying nematodes. Okay. So for us, um, like I say, I'm down in Niagara Falls. Uh, our ground's still frozen solid now. Right. But usually it's um, sort of the third week in April. Okay. And uh, it's as easy as putting, a, um, you know, a meat thermometer, the thing you stick in your turkey? Yeah. Yes. Stick that in the ground. Really? Yeah, that's, uh, that's how you do a soil temperature check. Okay. Stick it in the ground, check your temperature. It'll let you know if it's 10 degrees. You're good to put nematodes down. Okay. And you're good to put them down until, obviously, depending on your na- neighborhood. Once again, if we start getting into the Northwest Territories and way north, obviously, it's later in the For season. For sure. But usually about, uh, I wouldn't do it much past the second week in June. Okay. Okay. Because then they, at that point, they're pupating, and once again, the cuticle gets too hard for them to penetrate. Okay. So it's a fairly decent-sized window in the spring. In the fall, it's much, it's much, much larger. Right. You could go the second week of August until basically, once again, the soil gets down to 10. And the soil, they, 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 they'll they survive at 10 degrees. They just stop hunting, actively hunting at 10 degrees in the soil. Okay. Excellent. Very cool. The other question I get asked a lot is, um, uh, it's not such an issue in the spring but more in the fall, is how moist do I need to keep my mm. soil? Yes. yes. All That's the time. a big thing with nematodes. Everybody's, you got to water, you got to water, you got to water. And the reason you need to water is because the nematodes use the water channels to travel. Okay, that's their me- that's their highway. That's their method of finding uh, finding the grubs and that sort of thing. So, um, and it's hard to say. Like, let's say I don't know. You live in Wasaga Beach. Okay. Your sand, your soil is going to be really sandy. I live where there's a lot of clay, so mm-hmm. I put a little bit of water on my lawn. It stays. Whereas Wasaga Beach, it just washes out. Mm. So what I've developed is a quick test. I call it a, um, a, 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 um, a water water retention test. Okay. All you do is dig past the roots of the um, uh, grass. You grab a handful of your soil and you squeeze it. And if you know what I mean, it creates a plug, like when you open your hand. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. If it stays as a as a, a conformed, if the soil stays stuck together, you have enough moisture for nematodes to survive. Okay. If you open your hand and it all crumbles, you need to add a little bit of water. Okay. No, that's a great test. That's a great yeah, test. Yeah, so and it works for everybody's yard and it's consistent. Because if I say you need to turn on a sprinkler for an hour, yeah, depending on where you are, that could have very different results. Right, for sure. So this is specific to your yard. <laughs> yeah. So, John, we've just got uh, Gail is sending in an email. Yeah. Uh, says hello, no questions, just a very interesting show, show and uh, cool. sends lots of her thanks. Oh, lovely. And so, guys, I don't know about you, but I have like half a page or more of, of notes. notes of thoughts. <laughs> I, I thought I knew, but now I know in greater detail. So while John's here, if you guys have nematode questions, uh, jump in now. Send us an email. It's in studio at 101 uh, at gmail.com. In studio 101 at gmail.com. Excellent. Yeah. So this is because we we have talked quite extensively about nematodes on the show. Um, yeah. we, when we have our lawn, you know, our typical lawn care episodes. Um, but right. this is great detail to have, you know, even your expertise. Uh, the water retention test alone, I think, is great. Is a great. Yeah, and I got a couple of key points that are really that the, the I think there's a fair bit of misinformation out, mm. and it's it's, uh, it's important to get the right information. Perfect. And like like for for lawn grubs, we've talked about when to apply them. Nematode works, nematodes work on a variety of paths. It all depends on the life cycle of the path. You want to apply them at the right time. Um, so that's depending on what, let's say you're going for birch leaf miner or crane fly or cutworms or army worms. There's a particular time to apply them, and that depends on said insect. But there's also a, a time of day to apply nematodes. Mm -hmm. And this is pervasive throughout any of any time you're applying them. This is just sort of a hard and fast rule for when you're using nematodes, follow these. And the first one is your best time of day to do it, or the, what I say the ideal time today to do it, is at dusk. Okay. Because what, the way you apply nematodes always is you mix them with water, and then you sprinkle them on your lawn, or you sprinkle them on the particular tree or flower, or whatever you're having a problem with. So they travel through the water channels, like I say. So picture the nematodes in this little droplet of water. The nematode needs to get into the soil before it can do any good. So this little droplet of water ends up on a blade of grass. Now, if you're doing this on a very windy day or at midday, the sun and the wind is going to evaporate that, that droplet of water, the nematodes are going to die. So best to always do it at dusk. That way they have the opportunity overnight to get down to the soil before they get cooked in the sun. If it's really windy day, that's not good either because the drop, water droplets will evaporate, evaporate quite readily. To be honest, the best time to do it is on a rainy day. And I understand you'd look like the crazy neighbor watering the <laughs> lawn in the rain, but that's the best possible scenario. Okay. So if people start getting that in their heads, we want them washed off the leaf and into the soil because that's the only way they can survive and do their good is they got to get washed down into the soil. So before people were saying do it in the morning, I don't think that's a good idea. Personally, I say dusk. Okay. Just it gives them that bigger opportunity. And uh, let's say even with the, the dew in the morning, that helps wash them off to where they can do their good. So it's about placement. You're going to get them in the proper place. Okay. So that's a really good uh, uh, um, hint. Um, mm -hmm. I like the hose end sprayer method mm -hmm. just because good. the, like some people use watering cans, yeah. which is good. And that's <laughs> good if you're doing a small area to get good even dispersal. You'd like to, you need to um, uh, get it in a hose end sprayer so you yeah. can get good uh, um, depth and length with your spray. Yeah. To get it across a lawn type scenario. Okay, and that was pretty easy. We have uh, we discussed that in a past episode just because I think a lot of people are intimidated by all that too, and yeah. uh, so uh, it's really not as difficult. Uh, so uh, so definitely we'll let our listeners know to check that out um, in a past episode when we discuss that in depth, right? On on how to use a hose end sprayer. Yeah. yeah, and like I say, it's it's a it's a very effective tool when used correctly, and it's a, it's only a couple rules to follow. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so, John, we've got another question um, from Madden. Um, yeah. They're asking if you can use nematodes on other plant life besides a lawn. Yeah, one hundred percent. We've got a, uh, a pro we do one for birch leaf miner, which is, uh, as I'm sure you know, it's a uh, insect that mines through the leaves of the birch trees. They actually drop to the ground below the leaf canopy to, to pupate and turn into the, from the larva to turn into the insect. 
So that's one that is specifically designed for that particular pest, and you spray it around where the um, uh, the canopy of the leaf uh, is on the tree. You do it on the ground there. Okay. We also have a product for vegetable gardens and flower gardens. So um, let me see off the top of my head, like an iris borer. Let's say you've got a lot of irises. Right. Iris borers are notorious. They get into the uh, bulbs of the roots, and they burrow through there. So if you water your irises with nematodes, they'll get in there and they'll take care of the iris for um, um, uh, in, right in the bulbs themselves. Excellent. Uh, onion maggot would be another one, really good for that. Black vine weevil, we do a lot of work with, um, with uh, tree growers, like uh, nurseries. Okay. Because a lot of uh, coniferous trees ends up with problems with uh, black vine weevil. So, and uh, rhododendrons, if anyone has rhododendrons, that's another one, really big problem with black vine weevils. So you can water it into your rhododendrons, and it will take care of the black vine weevil. So there's a variety of pests that nematodes have to deal with. Okay. And also, if you are doing um, for grubs in your lawn, and you also want to do the perimeter of your gardens as well, don't you? I always say, if you got a little extra, throw it on your garden. Okay. One hundred percent. Yeah, because the grubs, my, you know, they're not. Uh, they'll yeah, migrate yeah. a little. They're going wherever there's food. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, that is good to know. So that is your number one selling uh, selling uh, product. Yeah, and it's the one I, I, I personally take a lot of pride in. We were um, a lot of people know nematodes now because there was a uh, pesticide ban that came into effect in 2012. Yes. And before that, no one really knew what nematodes were. There weren't many people selling them. We were we were producing them as of the year 2000. So we've wow. been in this. The nematode game, shall I say? Yes. For quite a while. Before all the pesticide bans came in place, we were already doing this. Yeah. So it wasn't we hopped on the bandwagon. We were already here. So yeah. we take a lot of pride in our product because we do make it differently, because we think it is a better product, and the results speak for themselves. Like anything, quality in, quality out. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so back to the ladybugs for just a second. Yeah. Um, where did they come from? Do you are you importing them? Are you raising them? Or you know? Yeah, ladybugs are um, harvested from the wild. Okay. They are an indigenous ladybug. Um, it's Hypodamia convergence is the only one that we deal in, and that is indigenous to Canada. Always has been. Now um, there's another ladybug that's sort of I call it a, a bit of a nuisance pest, and it's the Chinese lady beetle. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm in a very rural area, so it comes it can become a bit of a problem in rural areas. Some people say they bite. They've got an orange hue to them as opposed to the red hue. And the reason that they're getting prolific is because now we're planting soya bean in place of corn. So a lot of the farmers have replaced their crops because soybeans always get soybean aphids. There's been an explosion of a food source, so of course now this now this beneficial has mm. exploded in population. Oh, okay. And the reason I call them a nuisance is because in the fall they go in people's houses. Right. And that's the complaint that I hear from a lot of people. The reason is where they're from, the way they hibernate or the place they hibernate is in cliff faces, in cracks and crevices. Mm. Unfortunately, that's very similar in their eyes to aluminum siding. Right. <laughs> So, so they think they're just going to a nice little cliff, but in actuality, they're going into your windows. Right. So the, the ones that we sell, and the, the, the only ladybug you should purchase is Hypodemia convergent. Like I say, it's got red to it as opposed to an orange. And in the wild, they hibernate under leaf matter and humus, so they go to the bottom of the forest floor, and they hide under there. So they'll never get into your house. So they're not a, they're not a nuisance. The other guys are... A, still beneficial i just say they're beneficial with side effects <laughs> that's <laughs> right? perfect so they, they'll still eat some aphids and do some stuff but they're not the ones that we suggest you put in your garden right. right and now the thing with ladybugs is the most important thing and it seems it sounds so simple but people miss it all the time the most important thing is keeping them in your yard <laughs> yes how right? do you, do you that? release them they fly away they're not going to do any good so i got uh Four, maybe five quick steps. Ooh. That if you do this, they'll stay in your yard. Okay. Really, really simple steps, but it makes like such a big difference on your results. Okay. <laughs> so first thing is, um, when you let's say you bought them at a garden center, okay. you get them in your little package, take them home. You want to cool them down. You want to put them in the crisper of your fridge. Leave them there for 24 hours. Okay. Okay. What that does is it puts them kind of almost in a hibernetic state. And they can actually survive. This is actually a cool little side fact. They can survive that way for up to a month. No food, no water. 
Really? So it's just a defensive mechanism. They, okay. Their metabolism slows right down, and they don't they don't need to do anything. So what you want to do is cool them down. That's the most thing, most important thing. Because a lot of times people are buying them. It's June, July. It's hot. It's hot in the greenhouse or the garden center. Mm-hmm. Then they're in their car. By the time they get them home, they're cooking. Right? <laughs> so put them in the crisper overnight. Then the next thing is, once again, time of day always comes into into this factor. Release them at dusk. They fly during the day. They're a lot less likely to fly if you release them after dark or just as the sun setting. Okay. Right? Next one, and this is a crucial one, miss the plant. They've been in a bag, in your fridge, in your car. They're going to be super thirsty. So if you miss the plant and they get a drink of water, they're not, their tendency isn't to be like, oh, my gosh, i got to go find somewhere to get a drink. Okay. You've already supplied it for them. Right. Okay. More likely to stay. Then uh, a trick that I always find is really good, their nature, and I'm sure everyone's noticed it, if you, if you see them on a plant or you pick one on your hand, they always cr- crawl to the highest point. So your best bet is if you've got, we were talking about rose bushes with aphids earlier, if mm-hmm. you've got them on your rose bush, release them at the base of the rose bush. They will then climb up the rose bush, finding the uh, pest insects. So they'll find your infestation that way. Because their, their natural instinct is to climb. Okay. And you release them at dusk, so they're not going to fly. They're going to climb. And then, third, whatever, I'm, what, I'm not sure what number I'm at. Four <laughs> number <or> five. five. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last one, and I think this is the one where everybody misses. It's a really, really easy one. Is don't release them all at once. Mm, yeah. If you get a package, let's say you get a package of 1,000. Yes. Release some today, some the next day. Spread it over four or five days. Do 200 a day. So sprinkle a little one, a few out, put them back in the fridge. Okay. Sprinkle a few out, put them back in the fridge. You're more likely to have them stay if you go about these simple steps, and you'll get way better results, I promise. Excellent. Well, that is great information. Yeah. There's, there's actually a new product that's sort of out on the market that we're doing, and we call it Ladybug Food. And this is a great way to get ladybugs to come to your yard and, as well, other beneficials, be it uh, a green or a brown lacewing. The cues in it only work for um, uh, insect-eating bugs as opposed to plant-eating bugs. Oh, good. And, yeah, mm-hmm. it's kind of neat. What it is is a powder. It almost looks like uh, like a protein powder, you know, the stuff the gym guys take? Yeah. <laughs> it looks like that. And you mix it with water. And you can either do it as a foliar spray, so you mix it down with quite a bit of water and spray it on the leaves of the uh, tree, plant, whatever you're, you have, uh, aphids, to attract the ladybugs. Or you can do it, mix it down like almost a smoothie peanut butter consistency, and then you'd put it in the nodes of, let's say, the rose bush again. You put it in where the aphids are. And what this does is, like I say, it attracts them. If they're flying around anywhere near your yard, it'll attract them to exactly where the pests are. But if you're releasing ladybugs, and this is the part I think is really cool, if you're releasing ladybugs, ladybugs only lay eggs if there's a really abundant food source. Because mm. they don't want their eggs to hatch and there not be any food for them. Okay. So what you're doing is you're tricking them that there's more food there than there is, and they'll lay their eggs. And the key part about this is a ladybug will eat 25 aphids a day. The ladybug larva, it looks like a little alligator, they'll eat 50 aphids a day. They're ferocious. I call them the hungry teenagers of the bug world. <laughs> right? yeah. so those are the guys you really, really want. And by putting out a bit of beneficial insect food, you're fooling the ladybugs into laying their eggs. You end up with the larva. You're getting much better control. Excellent. Mm. Excellent. Okay. So is there timing as to, as to when to apply the food? Yeah, you can put that out anytime. If you see aphids, put it out. I mean, I've already got some uh, ladybugs flying around in my uh, in my uh, office. Okay. So <laughs> if they're if it's a little cold outside, but yeah, as soon as it gets as soon as it warms up, the ladybugs will be flying. So if you put out the beneficial insect food, that might draw them uh, draw them to you. As well as like I say, other other beneficials that are a little less known, like the uh, lacewings. Okay. So, yeah, you might get in, some of those guys bringing them to your garden, which is what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Anything we can do to attract the good guys. The yeah. good guys. And it's literally all this stuff, it's a numbers game. You know, you get enough of the good guys, they outnumber the bad guys, you mm, win. Yeah. Right. So, anything you can do to get more good on your side, you're doing well. Okay. 
So speaking of uh, our good guys, one good guy that I get a lot of questions about is the Praying Mantis. And I know there's a listener out there waiting for this section. Oh, yeah. They're my favorite. They're my personal favorite yeah. by far. I love the Praying Mantis. So can we maybe quickly talk about, you know, when is to release them and, and how to keep them in your yard? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, the way that they're um, sort of marketed and sold is in an egg case. So... Um, the egg case is, uh, I guess the best way, yeah, the, the, the egg case is, it's almost about an acorn size, it's brown, and in an egg case you'll have anywhere from 40 to 400 babies. Right. So that is actually how they survive the winter. So in the fall, when the first frost comes, all of the adults die. The only way the next generation is going to come out is if the egg cases hatch. Okay. So this is what, when I was a little kid, there was prey mantis everywhere. Like, I'd run around my neighborhood yes. and I'd go into the park and I'd find prey mantis. Yep. Now you hardly ever see them. Yeah. And there's a couple of reasons. One is that egg case happens to be really, really porous, so super susceptible to any chemicals. Like, one droplet, I, I couldn't tell you how many parts per million, but not many, hits that egg case, they all die. Wow. So that's part of the reason. The other reason is, when in urban environments, we used to have open fields. Now they're either grass or parking lots. Mm -hmm. And prey mantis, like, their ideal situation is grasses, waist to shoulder height. So that open kind of field. Okay. Um, I find them a lot, like, in my backyard, in my garden, I find them on my lilies. So think about, like, a tall lily, like that kind of environment, that's their preferred spot. Okay. All right. So what happens with the egg cases, because they're actually left outside all winter long in nature, when they get the right cues, i.e. temperature and uh, daylight, daylight, hours of daylight, they hatch out. And they hatch out, like I say, four to 40 to 400. So you can imagine 400 of these guys coming out. They're really cool in the sense that they're a perfectly formed prey mantis. They're just really tiny. So they hatch out of that egg. They're, they actually um, molt like a, like a lobster or a, or a snake. When they go to their next size, they break out of their skin, and they're just a bigger version of themselves. Mm -hmm. So they don't. Most insects do a larvae, pupate, turn and metamorphosize. These ones are kind of unique that they're born as they as they are when they're adults. Yeah. They're so, so when they cool. hatch out, it takes <laughs> about an hour to two hours for them to completely hatch out of the egg case. Like I say, they're tiny little versions of themselves, so they quickly run and hide. Um, and like most things, the reason there's 400 of them is because only a few make it to adulthood. Yeah. You know? yeah. Nature sort of, we make a whole bunch of them and <laughs> some make them that way. Yeah. So, so they run and hide really quickly. You tend to see them on the underside of uh, leaves or blades of grass. They tend to be green, brown, so they blend really well because they're, 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 the way they hunt is they're an ambush hunter. So they actually, and this is the cool part about them, they find one plant, they will live on that plant for their entire life. Really? So, yeah, yeah. That's the really neat thing about them. And that's oh, what that's I mean. They find a spot, and they, they that's their spot. They wait for food to come by and snatch it. Oh. So, I always thought they were territorial, like they covered so many square feet, and they would travel that little bit of an area. No. Well, it depends on the size of the plants, of course, yeah. <laughs> and how big they are. As they grow, and, they, and, they, and their, uh, their, their prey or their food generally smaller. So they're usually smaller than that. Right, and that's what I mean. They sit on oh. the other side of the leaf, they wait for stuff to go by, and then they pack it as it goes oh, okay. by. So I think you just kind of faded out there. Yeah, a second, I think you're John. moving around, John. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. But what was that last point you said about them, how they pr um, hunt? Yeah, so they, I said that basically they, uh, they eat their way up the food chain. They start with very small insects. They wait for food to go by, and then they snatch it. So if you can imagine when they're very, very small, they're catching, like, I don't know, a thrip, a white fly, then yeah. go up to ants, then work their way up to crickets, to caterpillars, to grasshoppers. So as they get bigger, their food source gets bigger as wow, well. Wow, that's cool. I, say they, I like to say they eat their way up the food chain. Yeah, <laughs> that is great. And I didn't know that they could do they could get uh, grasshoppers. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the, when you the more more than likely the only time you're going to see them is in the fall. And at that point, they're about the size of a, like a normal person's hand, and the boys are out looking for girls. So they'll actually get out of that hiding. They develop wings. They start to fly to look for a mate for to to continue the continue the next generation. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That is incredible. So the, and the beauty is, like I say, they stay in like if you if you put I always put an egg case in my veggie garden and one in my flower garden. 
And okay. I figure I got my little hunters hanging out there. They're looking after stuff. They're not going to run off to my neighbor's yard. They're actually going to stay in my yard, which okay. is great. So they're more likely to stay than the ladybugs yeah, stay on their own. Okay. Absolutely. And uh, depending on some people, like I like, I hatch them indoors, and then I release them outside. So if you're an insect person, you can actually, it's really easy to hatch them indoors. Then you get to see them, and then you sort of sprinkle them like pepper around your yard. That's right. So I have a, I'm gonna, I have to tell my little funny story really <laughs> quickly because we're running out of time. But, yeah. John, so this was years and years ago. I thought I was like, I have two boys. I thought I'd be a cool mom, and I bought my boys for Easter. I'm praying mantis eggs. Thought they were into bugs, of course, and whatever. I thought they were great. Opened the box, really cool. Um, didn't take them out of the the pouch or anything, but left the box open. Um, then went to my parents for Easter weekend, John. Uh, <laughs> I think I know where this is going. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we came home. So I was also the best mom ever because we came home from Easter weekend with our house covered in little baby praying mantis. Oh, yeah. So all over the shears at the front window. Uh, yeah, so I know how many hatch, John. I know firsthand, and I know they hatch in the house. So funny. that that was just, uh, yeah, so it was like a big oops on my part. I didn't think they would hatch so quickly. And uh, so anyway, so that was fun, the boys scooping them up trying to not hurt them and take them outside take and them out when good. there yeah, you go yeah. so yeah Super so fun. i had to share that um That's that was funny. yeah i mean they're 22 and 20 now so that was a long time ago but uh yeah, fair enough. yeah so that was a, my fun experiment uh uh, and when, that's why I really like them. I think they're super fun. Like people send me pictures every fall. Look what I found in my backyard. Yes, yes. And if you can get them cycling in your backyard, I always tell people like if you're gonna put prey mantis out in November, sort of maybe or late October, like when all the leaves have fallen off, walk around your backyard and look for egg cases. Oh. Because when the leaves are there, it'll be too hard to see them. But right. once the leaves are gone, you got a better chance of spotting them. And ideally, now you've got them cycling in your yard. Okay. It's always fun to find one. Like, if you find one in nature, you're like, yeah. Yes, for sure. For sure. Now, weird Easter egg hunt. So when <laughs> should we buy them, though? Um, right now. Absolutely. Okay. Now's a great time. Like I say, you can put them out now because they overwinter. Excellent. Right? So they do make a great Easter gift for your children and grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, you just need absolutely. to keep them in the fridge, right? Yep. You okay. Keep them in the, well, if you're going away for Easter, yeah, apparently. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, that's great. Uh, that's cool. So cool. That's Praying really cool. mantis. Excellent. Um, so the next thing on our list, which, of course, is on everybody's mind these days and getting a lot of press, are the lovely little bees. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're uh, sort of a new thing that we've gotten into, and they're so fascinating, and they're so interesting, and they do such a good job. The mason bee particularly, we okay. call it the gentle spring bee. Okay. And the reason, and this is what's great for families and anybody that wants to get into pollination, because they are a solitary bee, they don't make honey. Okay. So they don't have a queen. They don't have honey. They've got nothing to protect. So they're not aggressive. And when I say they're not aggressive, this is to the point where the boys do not have stingers at all. Ooh, that's excellent. The girls, they have a stinger, but it's not barbed, and there's no venom. So let's say you're allergic to bees, no anaphylaxis. Okay. Ooh. You can't get poisoned by this because there's no venom. So if someone's got a bee allergy, no problem with these guys. I get stung all the time because I handle them and I do shows and I hold them to show people. It's like a mosquito bite. Like it's inconsequential. It doesn't hurt at all. So in that sense alone, they're a great bee. So now you can have bees in your yard if you have a fear of bees, if you've got somebody that's allergic, all that's taken care of. And as far as for pollination... And they're phenomenal. They're like 100 times better than a honeybee. And the reason is, I'm sure you've seen it uh, when you see bees, they have a little pouch on their back legs. I call it their, their pollen socks. Mm -hmm. What they do when they go into a flower is they lick the pollen, they make it moist, and they stick it in these little pouches. So they've got like, it almost looks like super yellow calves. That's, <laughs> where, they, that's where they stash the pollen. So a mason bee, on the other hand, is a really, really fuzzy bee, and he's positively charged. So what that means is when they fly into a flower, the pollen sticks to them, like dick, 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 dick. Oh, okay. And, uh, and it, uh, it, um, I think of it as, how would I describe it? I think of it as, remember pig pen from Peanuts? Yes. Yeah. Think of that as pollen. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a big cloud of pollen around them. Whenever they fly into a flower, poof, that, all that pollen goes into the next flower. Then the next flower, poof. So that's why they're a better pollinator than a honeybee. 
And are and they what, are they native? They are. And well, they um, the mason bee originally comes from the West Coast, um, uh, BC, Oregon, Washington State. Okay. But since the 1900s, since man uh, has moved them around, they're pervasive throughout North America now. Okay. Um, the only place they're not really is the southern states, like Texas and stuff, because it's too hot for them. They don't do well with the heat. Oh, okay. But yeah, they're completely all across North America and have been since the 1900s. So they're considered indigenous now. And there's a there's a bee specialist. He's saying that there's actually now an East Coast and a West Coast genetic line. Oh. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Cool. And the leafcutter bees, uh, they're the same. They're in everywhere in the world except for Antarctica. So oh, okay. pervasive throughout okay. both of these. And this, the mason bees, they hatch. Uh, they're the very early hatchers. They hatch... Um, uh, this year, probably April, mid-April, they, their life expectancy or life life uh, is six weeks. Oh. And then the leaf cutters they hatch out in June, July. Okay. So yeah, it's interesting. If you if you set up a house and get some cocoons, you'll have two different types of bees pollinating for you throughout the season. So the mason bees will do like your cherry trees, your fruit trees, things of that nature, and the leaf cutter will do later stuff like uh, zucchini, squash, things of that nature. All right. And how can you tell us about your products? So how are you actually selling those or how can people buy them? Yeah. So with all of our products, we do them uh, through all of the higher end garden centers. We uh, we offer our products through garden centers. And then we also have an online presence, which would be uh, naturalinsectcontrol.com. And then we've got a small store um, in uh, Stevensville, but not many people around here. <laughs> <laughs> Online is probably the easiest. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. And like I say, uh, the, the, the higher-end garden centers tend to carry our stuff as well. Okay. So are you buying like a little bag of bees like we are with ladybugs? or? Yeah. So we, the way we sell the bees themselves are we sell them as cocoons. Okay. And the reason that uh, the mason bee is the first bee to fly in the spring is they do all their transformation or their metamorphosis this year, um, so they're ready to hatch in the spring. So as soon as it hits, uh, once again, 10 degrees seems to be the magic number, I know. As soon as it hits 10 degrees, the mason bees hatch out, and then they start to fly. Uh, leafcutter bees do most of their transformation this year, over winter, and then start their last metamorphosis in the spring this year, so that's why they hatch out a little later in the season. So. They're sold as cocoons. What you do is you purchase the cocoons. Um, you can either just put them out in your yard, or ideally you purchase a house with nesting reeds so that they can cycle in your yard. Okay. And do you sell the houses as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We, we do a kit. You can either buy bees by themselves, house by itself, or a kit with all the necessary tools so that you can have, have bees live cycling in your yard. I say it's kind of like um, buying a birdhouse, but you get the bird in it guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great. Guaranteed that's a great. A bird. There that's you go. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And like I say, these guys are particularly fun if you got kids. It's fascinating to watch them because I've actually put my hands over the house, and the bees they they so don't care about you. They'll walk over your fingers and go in and to lay their eggs and start their the process. All they care about is pollen. Wow. And the interesting thing, which I just found out recently, is the more pollen that goes in your flower, the bigger your flower. The more pollen that goes into your vegetables or your fruit, the bigger your fruit and your vegetables. So that's kind of interesting. These guys are really good because you're going to get more fruit, bigger fruit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that is very interesting. So the website, do you want to tell us what that website is for everybody who's curious and wants to check it, them out? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a bunch of information and products on our website, so it's a good one to check out for both. And it's www.naturalinsectcontrol.com. Easy. <laughs> yeah. And if you were to purchase something, one of our listeners, do you ship to the States or is it just Canada only for the live Canada. We do have one of our nematode products is available in the States. Um, but as you can imagine, with border and stuff, it's a bit difficult yeah. to ship stuff uh, across to the States. So only only one nematode product is available through a distributor in the States. Okay. But like I say, it's worth checking out our uh, website because there's a ton of information, and I've got, actually got links to some people that do sell stuff in the States. Oh, perfect. So our U.S. listeners aren't out of luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's good. That's good to know because, yeah, we do have listeners both in Canada and the U.S., so uh, Perfect. Excellent. So, um, are there any other products and services that NIC offers that 
Yeah, particularly this year. This year, last year, living in the Mississauga area, there's been a big gypsy moth problem. Really, really big. Devastating. Just cleaning trees, uh, cleaning trees bare. Um, so gypsy moths, and this is some of the other things that we do, our company motto, as you mentioned, is all about alternatives to chemicals. So instead of spraying a chemical, what we've got is a gypsy moth lure and trap. And what this is is mating disruption. So it's a hormone-based lure. So basically it smells like a girl. So all the boys go to this trap and get captured because with gypsy moths, I don't know if you know, but the girls, the girl moths don't fly. They just walk up and down the trunks of the trees. The boy moths are the only ones that fly. Okay. So this hormone smells like a girl. All the boys fly to the trap. They get trapped. Now there's no boys. Now there's no next generation. Mm. So it's mating disruption. So that's okay. something that's another way to get around using pesticides. Um, the thing that I, I like personally, what we're trying to integrate more and more, is called an IPM approach, which is integrated pest management. management. Yep. What that means is companion planting. So, um, like, marigolds are a really good uh, pest deterrent. Plant some marigolds around your garden. So planting planting stuff that will attract or, or, or detract insects from coming. So if you plant a, plant a, a set up a bush, then a particularly good insect likes and comes, then, you've got to, then you're ahead of the game. Right. Or, for instance, using birds. Right? If you set up the right birdhouse or a bat house, now you've got guys coming in eating the insects that might be causing you problems. So it's an integrated pest management. Looking in your backyard as a whole biosphere as opposed to just one aspect mm, of it. Yeah. So it's an interesting frame of mind. Excellent. No, that is a good uh, thinking about the the whole life cycle of everything, right, and how it all works together. Absolutely. Um, so Japanese, we did mention, so the nematodes, the Japanese beetle. So would you also sell the lures uh, for the Japanese? Cause yep. Absolutely. Okay. We do a lure and a trapping system for when they are, because realistically, one female Japanese beetle, I think in her lifetime, is capable of laying 500 eggs. Right. So every one you catch, you're saving 500 potential more. Sort right. Of thing. I do get a lot of people ask me, well, why would I set up a trap? Because now I'm just bringing them to my yard. Right. We both get that as well. Oh, yeah. All the, time. all the time. Yes. So it's, they're, they're, that's one way of looking at it. The way I say it is, let's say you've got a prized rose bush or a prized tree, and they're coming there anyway. Mm -hmm. Put the trap in between. Yeah. So now they're going to go to the trap. They're not going to go to your rose bush. Or let's say in some cases you've got a neighbor that's not doing anything. Right. So if they're doing no pest control. They're not looking after anything. they got tons of them. Put it beside there so that the, when they come from his lawn trying to get to your lawn, they're going to hit the trap. Right. And that's the other thing. Let's say you do get control of your lawn. It's looking really good. If I was a Japanese beetle and I was up in the sky and I looked at my neighbor, the, your neighbor's lawn, it's all dirt, not very grassy green. I look at your lawn, it's beautiful and grassy green. Where do you think I'm going to go lay my eggs? Yeah. So if you have the trap out, then she's, then she's going to go to the trap as opposed to your lawn. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's, it's what's going on in your neighborhood, not just your lawn. <laughs> <and I. laughs> true. That's very true. That's very true. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe time has flown by, John. This was so much great information. Oh, wow. It did go quick. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> um, yeah. Matthew, is there anything? Do we cover everything? We have our whole list for you, John. And I, but I think you did. I think you, you went on a roll there, and I think you covered a lot of information. Cool, and cool. Uh, so I think really important information on nematodes, ladybugs, praying mantis, mason bees. I don't think that's a common thing. I think people do not do not know that they could purchase those cocoons. No, I, they don't. They don't at all. Yeah. Yeah, it's really a new thing in the market. And people okay. are just... Because everybody knows what's going on with the honeybees, and everybody wants to do something. Yeah. And this is something you can do in your own backyard, right? Yes. And you're also creating an environment, for instance, if I just got a quick minute. Last year, I put up a bee house, and I have my leafcutter cocoons in there, and all of a sudden, I start seeing leafcutter bees. And I'm like, wow, they hatch so quickly. I opened my little place where the cocoons are, mine hadn't hatched. Uh -huh. This was just wild leafcutter bees. I gave them the environment they wanted. It's that old movie, Build It, They Will Come. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. that's literally what happens. So if we give them the environment, we just just by putting out the proper nesting tubes and the right stuff, the bees will come, and then we're just helping them out because 
as we know, the honeybees need help, and the more pollinators we can get out there, the better. And the more diverse pollinators we can get out there, the better. Yes, yes, and I think that's key because I think the problem has been the focus has been the honeybees, and the, everybody else is saying, well, what about there's more than the honeybee? There, that's yeah. you know the the native bees are even more important and Very even more so. plentiful and even more you know key to our gardens. So so 100%. I think this is this is great because it does take the focus off the honeybees a little bit and yep. puts it on uh, things we can control right because we all can't have honey bees in our yards oh, but no, yeah, you so know much. for one there's the stinging and you got to have all the gear and stuff. that's right these are, these are stu- literally i think if you set up a mason bee house i think you you're out your yearly input of time and effort's about five hours yeah so wow all up. But that's everything that's <laughs> yes doing everything from start to finish yeah so. Excellent. Most people can spare five hours out of the year. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, this has been super informative, and I'm excited that it's going to be saved as a podcast so we can, uh, <laughs> so everybody can go back and listen to all that great information. Yeah, it was really good talking to you both, and uh, I'm glad that uh, you enjoyed the uh, stuff, and hopefully uh, your listeners uh, picked up some uh, good little hints. Absolutely. I think so. Awesome. And thank you very much again, John, for coming on the show. We look forward to talking to you again sometime in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be open to that. And, okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Bye now. Well, there you have it. So that's a lot jam-packed show. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Right we to the wire. We learned a lot of uh, information, uh, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, natural insect control. We're all starting to think about our gardens and... Uh, so definitely take it easy while you're cleaning up your gardens. It's still a little early to do that, mm-hmm. but uh, consider that there are a lot of beneficial insects that are wintering in some of that debris. So consider that. That's it. Hopefully you guys really enjoyed this information-packed show. I mean, everybody has mixed feelings about bugs, but hopefully uh, you know you got a new outlook on your, your garden. Um, just I guess we're running out of time. Just quickly, uh, don't forget to follow uh, Joanne. Uh, you can reach her at down the number two earth.ca and all the links to her exciting uh, social media. Don't forget to follow me at naturalaffinitydesigns.ca and the links to all of my exciting uh, stuff as well. Uh, you can also find the podcasts on uh, through Joanne's site as well as on the Google Play and uh, the iTunes store. That's so right. don't forget to check out past episodes, including this one, which will be released very shortly. That's right. That's right. Thank you to all of our listeners, um, uh, Madden and uh, uh, Gail, for writing in. That's right. And thank you for everyone for joining us down the garden path here on Reality Radio 101. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101.